Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the Asus ROG Sephiris S GX 531GX. This is the RTX 2080 Max-Q powered version of the exact same laptop that I reviewed previously. So please be sure to check out the video in the description, as that will cover some other points of this laptop and goes into a good depth about it. And the, basically the only change here is the inclusion of the brand new RTX NVIDIA GPU. It is otherwise the same stylish snazzy laptop. It's worth noting, as you can see the horrible fingerprints on this one, that I am not the first person to use it. It was sent for review purposes, and but otherwise it is joyfully fun as much as the last one. For those of you that don't know, this is a very high-end gaming laptop that will set you back with the RTX 2080 a staggering £3,000 or $3,000. It is very high-end though. You do get an Intel Core i7-8750H CPU, 16GB of DDR4, 2666MHz RAM, a 500GB NVMe drive, which is upgradable. I think you can get a maximum of a terabyte in here. And as I said, the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2080 Max-Q GPU. The highlight is almost certainly the 15.6 inch IPS panel, which is 1080p and is capable of a 144 Hertz refresh rate with a three millisecond response time. That has some really fantastic visuals on it. Uh, I really enjoyed that before. Also, you have this front forward keyboard layout, which I really liked in the previous model. It's really interesting design. And that touchpad on the right instead of in front, which I find much better because you're far less likely to accidentally set it off. The fans are set back. So you can see that's what the scratch marks on the top of that is. That's where the cooling goes in and, and sucks the air into the top of the machine and blows it out the back. They, this is one of the thinnest gaming laptops that you can get. It's an Ultrabook style, so basically it closes down, it goes really thin, it's lightweight, it's easy to transport around. It's also made from aluminium, and it's put through various military-grade tests to make sure it can stand up to some abuse, so it's designed to be taken with you on the go. The downside of that is the battery life isn't amazing. For, average, for general use it's okay and actually performed better than the previous laptop that I tested and I think I had problems with that to be honest but this one I managed to get four hours of Netflix streaming out of it which I thought was pretty good that was with the RGB lighting on the keyboard off and the display visuals down and the sound relatively low um, but that managed to yeah, get four hours gaming wise though I found it basically impossible to play high-end games on battery. It just won't run those games. The GPU won't run at full tilt, so the frames are awful, and I'll show you that a bit later on. However, you can play casual games on it, but if you do so, like Train Valley 2 I played, for example, and Apex Legends just about runs on it with pretty rubbish frames, but it will run, and you can get about an hour's worth of use out of gaming that way. So if you're thinking about buying a laptop that you want to be able to take with you out of the house and game on the train or something crazy like that, then you'd probably be disappointed if you're expecting to play Battlefield 5 while you're out and about. It does have a number of connections though, as you can see here. We've got USB-C inputs on both sides and uh, two USB inputs on the left, the power input and a mic headphone jack as well. It also is has this HDMI output on the back, but one of the USB-C ports is DisplayPort capable as well, so that's worth knowing. When you open the lid, you'll see the bottom vent here opens up. That is how the cooling works and how they manage to keep it nice and thin. You'll also note, if you look closely, on either side of that, you get some RGB light bleed. Now, you can obviously adjust that within the settings. There's a piece of software called Armory Crate, which is downloadable for both your phone and comes installed on the machine, that you can adjust the lighting so you don't have to have that lighting on. If you want to take it into the office, then you can turn that off so it's not too in your face. But this is otherwise understated. It's a really stylish looking laptop, and it ought to be for this amount of money but there is a high bit of quality design to it and the workmanship on it is fantastic it looks great from every angle if that's the sort of thing you're into then that won't disappoint for me though is the gaming prowess of the machine that's important and i really like the screen on this it has very thin bezels as you'll see in a bit which means you get a 
what appears to be a larger screen and a smaller chassis. So it feels like a bigger, much bigger screen than it actually is. And it doesn't feel like a tiny, tiny laptop that you're squinting to see. The trackpad also doubles the numpad, which is a nice feature so you can turn it on and off. And it has an LCD display that allows you to use it as a numpad if you're doing spreadsheets and whatever else during the day. And you have easy access with the function buttons here. So you can see you can change the RGB lighting by quickly switching between them by using the function key and the left and right keys. And you can press up and down on the directional buttons as well to turn the brightness up and down on that keyboard. And then obviously you've got access to all the usual media keys as well. On the right hand side here you can see the other USB-C and USB port that I was talking about. Plenty of uh, options there so it's good if you want to set it up with the Oculus Rift for example which is one thing I did do in testing which works perfectly. There is a bit of a stretch with that cable if you've got a Rift you'll know the USB, USB connection and the HDMI connection are kind of tied together so it's a bit of a stretch to get it around the back but it works. The HDMI output also obviously lets you put out to bigger screens. So here I'm using a 34 inch 1440p monitor, which is only capable of 60 hertz. So you can't run that screen at the same hertz refresh rate as the laptop screen itself. But obviously if you want to plug it in and get bigger visuals, then you can do that. Now I found that Battlefield 5 on ultra settings ran at about 50 frames per second on this screen at being output from the laptop which isn't bad. One downside, one major downside to this laptop which you can probably hear in this footage and you'll certainly see later on is the amount of noise that it makes. Because of the ultra slim design they obviously have to make a compromise in terms of the cooling capabilities and that's despite all the heat sinks and fans with inside. Now the way the laptop draws heat away from itself by sucking cool air into the top and blowing it out the back actually works quite well but it still gets very hot especially with the RTX running and the graphics set to ultra as you can imagine that's quite a lot of processing and it's quite intense so that means it makes a lot of noise um, now it is worth noting the speakers are fairly capable the sound that you're hearing in this gameplay is actually being output by the laptop itself not by the screen and so it is good at blocking out that sound. One downside is because of the amount of noise that the fans make, the microphone on the laptop picks that a lot uh, up a lot if you're doing things like recording or if you're playing with your friends and using Discord or something like that and you're relying on the mic and speaker combination to be able to talk to them so they hear a lot of that sound. You can however access the wonderful NVIDIA DLSS and DXR settings um, it's worth noting that I fully updated Windows and all the NVIDIA drivers to make sure I could do that properly on the laptop when I was testing a bit later on. But I wanted to show you also what happens if you have the settings all turned on and then unplug the laptop and you'll see that it is pretty horrific. This is with the latest NVIDIA drivers as I said. It managed to get 6 frames per second in Battlefield 5 with everything maxed out and running on an external screen. That exactly has the same problem running on the laptop screen as well, so it's not because of exporting to an external screen. It, on power it's fine. Now as I said for other games like Apex Legends, I think I managed to get 20 or 30 frames per second. And on casual games also similar results. Plugging back in and playing a bit of Dirt 2.0, you can get a taste of what the speakers are like. And actually this game is a good test for that and it demonstrates that the speakers are actually pretty capable. It is actually also one of the only games I managed to use where the game made enough noise to block out the sounds of the fans. Those fans do get picked up by the microphone which is quite frustrating. But the audio quality when you're not using the mic and just enjoying the game is quite good. Some in-game footage and you get to see how the uh, computer handles uh, this game. And set to ultra and maximum settings across the board it was averaging around 70 frames per second which is actually fairly decent. It doesn't have the same high-end settings as Battlefield and Metro Exodus. There's no RTX capabilities here but it still delivered a very smooth experience. Also looking forward to trying this bad boy out in VR at some point in the summer. 
Dirt 2.0 is very good fun. And then some footage from Battlefield. Now, as I said, Battlefield 5 won't run on battery. It was basically unplayable, and I'll show you that in a bit. But here you can see running on the screen at 144 hertz with RTX DXR DLS S activated. It was averaging around 80 frames per second. One thing I did notice, and it's worth bearing in mind, is that this wasn't an entirely smooth experience which is interesting and might be a sign of how bleeding edge this technology is but I found that more than once the frame rates suddenly dropped without warning right down to around 20 frames per second and it stuttered. Testing other games I ran it through Shadow of the Tomb Raiders benchmarking and managed to get an average of around 74 frames per second with everything set to high which is actually fairly decent I also tested it with 3D Mark, and I'll put some links in the description to the various tests that I did with that. But I ran it through their newest uh, update for that, which is DLS S test and the Port Royal test, which is testing ray tracing, and that got some pretty decent scores. As I said, for general use, it actually gets really good results. I found a very smooth experience with a lot of games I played. Battlefield and Metro Exodus were problematic when pushed to the limit with settings on Ultra. And you can see it in action here. Now with Metro Exodus at 144Hz you can set quality to Ultra, DirectX 12 on, and you can set all the Nvidia Hairworks and Advanced Physics on, and then get some really stunning graphics out of that. The downside is it isn't a very smooth experience. I found when there was intense battles or really taxing scenes, the frames just drop right off. Not constantly, it regularly was up high and was delivering a glorious, beautiful picture. But it does have problems. It usually ran at around 50 frames per second as well, so not quite as high as Battlefield. But it's perhaps a bit more visually intense and maybe not as well as optimised. It is worth noting that this is obviously running the latest version of Windows. All the Windows updates and the NVIDIA drivers most up-to-date ones. And actually, happy to report that this Max-Q GPU, you can get your NVIDIA drivers state from an NVIDIA GeForce. You don't need to rely on the manufacturer, which is a problem with previous Max-Q GPUs. This one actually gets updates straight from NVIDIA, so really quick and easy to get. And here I'm demonstrating that gameplay with everything turned up to maximum, and it looks absolutely stunning. But you'll quickly see in a minute how the frames drop right down and it becomes a real slideshow and it's quite painful. You get an attack by multiple creatures at once and it suddenly the frames just dropped off the cliff. It was playing at around 50, 60 frames per second. They went right down to 10 or 20 frames and then it went back up again. And there wasn't anything else running in the background, though obviously I was recording, so perhaps running the game at maximum with everything on and recording the footage at the same time might have been a factor, but I also tried turning the recording off and doing it without. Now, playing a bit of Cuisine Royale, which is nowhere near as taxing, it ran nice and smooth, got decent frame rates, and performed well on a regular basis. One thing you'll note in this footage, though, which I'm going to go quiet for in a minute, is if you listen, you can hear that the microphone is picking up the sound of the fan, so the humming that you can hear is actually from the fan, so just listen out for that. As you can see, it unfortunately picked up a lot of feedback, which is partly G-Force, but there was a distinct humming that you can hear. It's quite difficult to put across how much noise you get from the fans. You'll have to take my word for it, that is a lot, especially when you're pushing games to the limit. The laptop itself does get very, very hot during gameplay as well. Perhaps hotter than the 1070 powered version that I was testing out before. It gets very hot on top, and it will be hot for using on your lap as well. However, you are getting what is essentially a very powerful machine into a very slim form factor, so it's not a surprise. And it's not necessarily a problem. If you're wearing a headset and you've got a decent microphone that's separate and isn't, you're not relying on the speakers 
and mic on the laptop, then you probably won't have any problems. Now, one of the things I didn't cover necessarily in too much depth in this video is the RGB lighting. You can get RGB lighting across the keyboard. It also features Aurora Sync, so you can sync it up with other ASUS devices if you have them. That software is available on your phone and also installed on the laptop. You can go through a variety of color settings. You can do it with the keys on the keyboard as I demonstrated earlier, but if you want to see software in action, you can watch my other review of the same laptop but with the 1070 where I'll show in a bit more detail what you can do with it. Also, I'll add a link in the description to that software so you can get an overview of that. It basically means that you can customize the keys the way you want them and even to various sections within the keyboard as well, which is pretty neat. Obviously, you can turn that lighting off when you're using it on battery to save battery life and customize your experience across the board. All in all, this is not a bad gaming laptop. It is certainly very nice to look at. I really like a lot of the features. The numpad and trackpad on the right is excellent. The forward facing keyboard is also excellent. Dual to use for day to day use, surfing, streaming working whatever else you want and it's stylish enough to take with you to the office as well so that's a bonus it is however in this specification three thousand pounds or three thousand dollars as i said which is incredibly expensive that's a lot of money and you'd probably get better performance out of a similarly priced desktop machine or one you bought yourself however the 144 hertz screen is something special i really like the visuals on it the way you can change the visuals to suit what you're doing and it is very compact and nice in that way, but not so compact the screen is tiny. It actually felt comfortable to use for gaming sessions. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, subscribe and come back for more in future. I'll be doing some more gaming laptop reviews in the near future. Thanks very much for watching. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions. And please be sure to check out the description as I will add all the specifications of this laptop and links that are worth checking out. Thanks very much.